My name is Pini Resnik from Container Solutions. I'm uh, based in Amsterdam. We're a consulting company helping to move to cloud native, which is not really important right now. Yes. So I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm I'm going to tell a story. And uh, like Tolstoy said, there are basically two types of stories: either uh, a man goes to the journey, or a stranger comes to town. So our story will be about a stranger that comes to town. I'm specifically going to talk about financial industry, but it doesn't really specifically apply to financial industry. It's generally a story about a fictionary company. So the company, and I'm going to talk about it throughout the, the, the story. It's called WealthGrid. Again, it's a fictionary company, but it's a it's sort of compilation of our customers. So we are helping customers to move to cloud native, and this is a typical example. It's a financial company, uh, mid-size, maybe two, three hundred people, pretty successful, nice place to work, very much waterfall and predictable culture. So they uh, they are pretty successful in their industry, right? They uh, again, nice company to work in, and um, uh, they know their market. They are making money. They are pretty stable and growing. A bit. Within this company, we're going to meet these characters. The main character is Jenny. She is the technical manager, right? So she's uh, something like head of engineering or head of operations or director of something like that. And also CEO and the engineers themselves. But Jenny is the main character of this specific story. So who is the stranger? Uh, there are three types of strangers in this specific industry, financial industry. So the first one is companies like ING in Netherlands. It's one of the biggest banks in the world. The difference between ING and other banks is about six, seven years, eight years ago, they decided that they are an IT company. So they're explicitly saying we are a IT company, we're a tech company with a banking license rather than a bank with IT department. And since then, they're investing massive amounts of effort to actually make their IT supporting their business, actually making IT their business. The second example, second stranger, is companies like Starling Bank. They are all over. Starling Bank specifically is a new, uh, it's, a, a ch it's called Challenger Bank, uh, specifically based in London. Uh, the big difference between Starling and other banks is that they, they could build an entire bank in a year, essentially. Right? So from the point they got a license until they have functional uh, functional bank with actual real accounts with real money on it, it took one year. So all the IT, all the infrastructure, all in cloud, everything fully functional. Um, and there are dozens of those. In Europe alone, there is uh, around 30 of them. and probably around new one every month or so. Uh, there are also a few of them in Israel. So today you can open a, a bank account in 10 minutes, get the credit card and st start upload some money and start paying within minutes. And the third one is, uh, is this massive companies like Amazon. So Amazon are um, uh, Obviously, no kind of different industries and uh, selling stuff and uh, doing com uh, cloud computing. But the interesting point is that they have banking license. Did you know that? Anyone knew that? Anyone cares? <laughs> no. Uh, the point is that they say, basically, the, uh, uh, the analysts say that if they decide to actually provide banking services, they can capture 70 million customers in the two, three years within US alone. Right? So they could be one of the biggest banks in the world if they decide to. Which is, of course, pretty scary for traditional banks. Now, one of the reasons that uh, they should be afraid, or there is an existential threat for existing uh, players in the industry, is that Companies like WealthGrid, like traditional banks or traditional financial companies, they incrementally increase in the value. So they're delivering pieces of software, they're delivering some functionality, improving a bit their systems. But it's happening linearly. 
The thing is that those new disruptive technologies, they are exponential. So their growth is exponential. In the beginning, it doesn't feel like that, but when they start growing, it's, uh, they capture the market almost instantly. And this is not explicitly about technology, right? About technology sector. Companies like Uber or Airbnb, obviously they're operating in very much physical world of uh, global reach of taxis and, and hotels, but local implementation. And they're dominating the market and they didn't exist really about 10 years ago. So they're, they capture the market almost instantly. So what's actually the reason for that is generally is ability to deliver value faster, basically build things very quickly, get them to the market, learn quickly, and do something else. So run a lot of experiments very quickly, and, um, and then deliver something that is actually valuable. So those companies, those newcomers, they can go through this, lear through this learning loop much, much faster. And the major reason for that is technology, obviously. And uh, obviously, I would say that because we are called native company, right? So uh, of course, we, we think that this is uh, the main reason. Um, and cloud native technologies, uh, which are, I'll talk a bit later what it actually means. Right, and again, to reinforce the existential threat to existing industries that if today company like Wellsgrid or traditional bank is pretty much certain in their capabilities and their revenue and their market share, and they see these newcomers like, uh, like Starling Bank, and they feel like ah, they don't have any, any impact on the industry. They are, only have a tiny portion of the market share. Who cares? They only have 1,000 customers, so 10,000 customers. The thing is, what happens when they actually get any sort of traction, like from tech, uh, 10,000 customers, they get 20,000 customers, they need immediately go to, uh, to get funding, and they can essentially get unlimited funding, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, and invest back into R&D. And basically, everything is go goes into building new uh, pieces of technology. So at some point, when the traditional bank understands that uh, the newcomer has this massive traction, it's typically too late to react, right? Because at that point, a traditional bank will start cutting costs. Because if their revenue is starting to go down even by one or two or three percent, percent there's pressure from the market to reduce costs and get to back to profitability. So those are just business reasons to immediately cut R&D costs. So the traditional company will cut R&D costs instead of spending more, while the newcomers will put everything they have in R&D. So back to Wellsgrid. So at this point, Jenny, and she's in between engineering and business, right? So she's a manager, but also engineering manager. She understands something needs to be done. And first, she's like, how hard can it be, right? Some pieces of Kubernetes, a bit of Docker, you know. We'll just put it in our backlog, scrum through it very quickly, and in three months we'll have everything running. Yes. About six to 12 months, and this is from our experience, again, this is a compilation of our, uh, our work with our customers. It's about six to 12 months later, what happens is actually only tiny portion of what was planned to be done was actually done, right? Majority wasn't done because there was consistent pressure to deliver new functionality, to build more stuff. The customers demand things. There is, you know, there's always, uh, there's always a crisis on delivering that feature to that customer. And if not, they will leave and then everything will go in flames and stuff like that. So, what happened actually, the, even those people who were actually working on setting up Kubernetes and, uh, and doing cloud native uh, techie stuff, they actually most of the time were busy with doing other things. Okay. At that point, Jenny realizes that we need to do something else, right? It's just not working. We're already six to 12 months into the transformation and nothing still uh, is done. So this, this time, that she's confident that she knows what to do next, which is we have to allocate proper amount of resources to the transformation. 
What does it mean? We take half the team, we put them to build cloud native platforms, CI CD and everything. And in a few months we will have everything. Now of course, this is a massive investment. So she needs to get the permission from it's not that, right? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> um, so she needs to get the permission from the CEO, for exec from executive team, and uh, uh, but it's not really per it's, it's more like approval. So she spends two or three months preparing very detailed documentation, goes to the managers, gets the approval. Half of the team goes into new development, and half stays on the legacy. The legacy is is the current product, right? So it means that since half of the team went off, it means that. The development is now very, very slow, if at all, right? It's, uh, there's mostly support for existing customers, but no new value is delivered. While the, new, the half of the team is working on creating new cloud native uh, platform. But six to 12 months from that point, again, only small portion of the work is done. Somehow there's only maybe 30% is finished and there's still no end to see. And at that point, uh, we are already one or two years into this transformation, and sometimes it's even longer. So this is pretty unusual for this company because the RT department was always successful, always delivered on time, was pretty high quality, and here we are one or two years into the transformation, there is still a struggle, and the IT department doesn't even know when it's going to be finished. So, why it's so difficult? Yeah. Um, so, first, what is actually cloud native? And this is a definition from CNCF, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, who essentially own the term of cloud native, or define the term of cloud native. And they, they say that cloud native is microservices, containers, and dynamic orchestration. Basically, Docker, Kubernetes, and microservices. And they say, to build great products faster, which we agree, which is that learning loop, doing faster, not larger scale, but more faster. Um, and this is again by CNCF. Uh, this is called the landscape. It's only partial list of tools, technologies, and vendors. And you may find yourself your own company on one of those. Or, but this is very much partial list. Like, uh, recently, I saw increase from 700 to 1,200 boxes in this chart. So. That's why it's easy, it's very complex. It's not very finished, it's not finished ecosystem, it's still work in progress. But more than that, uh, what we think is not just the architecture provisioning and, uh, and architecture. So it's not just microservices, Kubernetes and Docker. But actually, there's many more points to it. Right? Like uh, uh, the previous, no, the, pre the first speaker was saying, there is a lot about uh, are you doing CI CD? Are you doing uh, right management, uh, the right team structure? And eventually all the way up to the culture. Because if you can deliver technically, you can deliver faster, every day you can deploy a new microservice, but you are not testing new assumptions against the customers, then what's the point to deliver faster? It really is relying, to, to have a cloud native environment, you are relying on having all these elements of the, of the cloud native world done right. right. So um, just as an example, imagine you have microservices but no CI CD. So instead of three components that you're delivering every six months in waterfall environment, now you have 150 microservices, each with hundreds of containers and all de uh, delivered every day. If you have no CI CD, you will be stuck delivering those things manually forever. Right. Same with hierarchy. If you have a hierarchy, a hierarchical st management structure, and the enterprise architects and the managers decide what to be delivered, it's just not practical in the world of, of microservices and continuous delivery. So that's why everything needs to be aligned. So back to WealthGrid. Basically, after this one or two years, and this difficult situation when the, uh, nothing is moving on, the manager is like the CEO, uh, where we really, really have to move on, right? Uh, you know, these, fi these five features that we promised to our customers, they have to be out very soon. And soon I mean next three months. And if they are not soon, the entire transformation is essentially canceled, right? Because 
Um, we just cannot wait. We are losing customers. We promise things. We are losing our reputation. So at some at that point, uh, of course, canceling the transformation is not a good idea because people will start leaving because they 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 like these technologies, and there are all kind of different negative effects to that. Okay, so we must do something else again. Before. I'm going to explain what Jenny Effect essentially done, that I have, have done. I'll introduce a couple of tools that I'm going to use in the, in the solution. So tool number one is difference between creativity and proficiency. Um, so the creative, creative state, and this is coming from design thinking book, Creative state is like a startup state. This is the state where everything is a mystery. You have no idea what you're doing. You have some random idea. You don't know where it came from. You have no idea how to create a new good idea. It's just sort of semi-random. It's like scientific research. Uh, so this is the world of startups. When things are just the best guess is as good as any. Then it becomes a heuristic. So imagine the first stage, it's like McDonald's 70 years ago when they just invented the, the McDonald's concept. The, the only difference was instead of actually driving and parking in front of the restaurant and waiting until the, the waiter will come to your car and serve you, you could actually approach the counter and get the food faster. So that was the, the big idea of McDonald's. And it did work out in one restaurant. And at some point, they grew into four which was still working, but it was still relying very much on the owner of the, on, of the manager of the restaurant. And that becomes a heuristic stage. Basically, when things sort of working, you sort of understand that they are working, but you don't know why yet. And then it becomes algorithmic, like today. When you open a McDonald's restaurant, you get a book, and you do it by the book. There is no going around, right? It, it's very much algorithmic. Like Toyota production system, you produce cars by the book. There is no, there is no, um, there is no creativity in McDonald's today. Not in major delivery of the major products. So, and that basically, in creative, creative teams require different type of management. They create, they define, they require a vision, uh, independence, trust in their abilities. You cannot manage innovation in the sense of you cannot say. I need two pieces of innovation in seven days, and this is the type of innovation I'm going to get. The farther you go into algorithmic, more enterprising and, uh, and hierarchical you become. Um, also, the management structure is different, but at the end, you make more money when you, when you use economy of scale, when you become more what, bigger, right? You, and you build proper processes. In algorithmic stage, it's all about consistent processes and predictability. So you manage for creativity by creating purpose, by supporting, by safety and autonomy. You manage for proficiency by high repetition, uh, high feedback, and set of small rules. Right? So you want to be effective and make a lot of money, you need to have simple rules and, and, uh, uh, and consistent delivery. But that drives creativity out. So there is a trade-off between those two. This is the uh, uh, McKinsey model from 80s or 70s. And basically, they say the same thing, that you need to invest in three horizons. The current horizon of current, current products. The next horizon is innovation, which will be current products in 12 or 24 months. And future research. So they say that typical companies should invest significant most of the time into delivery of current products, significant portion into innovation, and a bit into research. How would you call this company? That invests 95% of their time into current delivery. Not forward thinking. Not forward thinking. OK, that's one way to say. Yes. This one? <laughs> okay, yeah, sort of. Startup. True. Yes. No customers. This one. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, unfortunately, many enterprises they forget how to innovate. They only think about the products they sell now, 
which means that whoever doing something new, they, they are just not aware of that. Of course, the second one is startup. They have no customers, so by definition, everything they do is more or less innovation. And universities is actually their business to, to research. So the second tool, very quickly, is patterns. This is the same as design patterns that later was introduced into, uh, they were introduced into software development, but basically it came from uh, architecture, actual proper architecture, from Christopher Alexander in the 70s and 80s. And the general idea of patterns is very simple. Pattern is like a word, right? It's a, it's a table, chair, sofa, right? It means that it's, it's a language that we can use to talk about complex terms. If you try to figure out what is a table, I, I can challenge you, you try to define a table with like def what are defining features of a table, there are none. There are no legs, number of legs, the height, the nothing, right? You can't really define the, de the table because it can be weird, and yet we understand what it means. And when you see any of those tables, we agree that this is a table. So it's sort of a vague concept that can be implemented in many ways, but allows us to talk about it in pretty clear ways. The, sen the second concept is, is uh, language, uh, uh, pattern languages. This is like all the words on certain topic, like furniture language. And the third concept is designs. Designs are stories. There's a square table with four chairs and sofa in the room. So now imagine you need to say the same thing without having those three words. It's very difficult, right? It's very difficult. It's even worse than difficult because, uh, because it's worse than difficult because in many cases you don't even agree with the, with the other side. You think both sides think that they know what table is, but they don't. So that's how you talk about cloud native about something or continuous delivery and two sides think about totally different things and they keep communicating like they understand each other. So we have created a bunch of those patterns specifically for cloud native transformation. So what happened so far is basically that Wales Grid, in the first attempt, they, they didn't allocate enough creative effort for, that, for the transformation. And in the second attempt, they did allocate a lot of people, but they managed them for proficiency. Scrum, right? Just iterate fast through innovative tasks. This is very difficult and more or less impossible. So how would Jenny design a successful transformation? And this is based on our experience of actually guiding those transformations and, and making them successful eventually. And it starts with uh, finding transformation champion, defining business case. In many cases, there is no, no actual, business, actual business reason to move to cloud native. It's expensive and not needed. And after that, getting executive commitment. Without executive commitment, all this is worthless because it's, it's actually very expensive. And eventually, you will ask for more money. This is like one of those uh, Trump projects, right? It's not going to end and it needs more and more money. Um, then you define a vision first and a core team. And it's important to define a small core team and not put 50 people on, in creative tasks. There is, a pro there is a reason that startups don't start with 50 people. It's just against, so you, in the beginning you need to have a small team uh, to figure out what to do. Because there's just too much communication and too much work you need to create for those people to get busy. And after that, we divide the team into uh, manage proficiency, basically the same legacy system, continue building the value for the current customers. And um, the creative tasks that actually start through experiments, through POCs, getting to MVP of the platform, actually building the cloud native platform as fast as possible uh, by creating distributed systems, microservices, Docker, and everything else, while preparing the rest of the company for eventual onboarding. And this is a gradual process, because if you bring everyone in, there will be just too much trouble. Right? The platform is not ready. Uh, the team doesn't have enough knowledge. There will be just too much support, too much um, fighting with the existing platform and never improving it. And at the end, gradually, team by team, onboarding to the new platform, and then continuing to uh, strangling the monolith and eventually lifting and shifting from the existing environment maybe to the cloud if needed, if relevant, 
but also in investing into continue investing in future innovation in three horizons. And each one of those patterns can be expanded and, and we can go deeper and deeper into it. Uh, so basically at the end, you can play with creativity and, and proficiency to, uh, to have this kind of cloud native innovation task when you have clear deliver innovation and research. And at the end, it's not really about cloud native innovation. It really is about innovation in general, right? So the idea is that uh, you always need to look into those future three horizons and think what's coming next. Because if you don't, then eventually somebody else will come and, and do it for you, like for Kodak and other companies. So you want to innovate and be prepared for new technologies. And the stranger is coming, but you, probably if you do it this way, you will be ready. So this is all written in this book. And what we do typically, we use this deck of cards and we play with, uh, with our customers to actually define a journey. There are different journeys, but it's, it's an easy way to actually um, design the transformation in the right way appropriate for each customer. So if you want the deck of cards, you can download it, not download it. You can ask for it. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.